Microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the third week of May 2011. For more than 20 years, a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion on the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio, and when censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, which does, in fact, seem to be an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet. I'm Carl Estevan. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoak. Our format is to take a few minutes each at the top of the hour and mention some events from the week, and then take turns asking one another questions about what's been said. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice as long as we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true that will sound like it's from Neptune. Today is Friday, May 20th, 2011, the day after a speech by President Obama that was announced as setting a single standard, the renunciation of violence, for groups including Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and others seeking engagement with the United States. Chomsky commented, it follows that the U.S. will no longer engage with Israel, which has long relied on violence to impose its will and its highly discriminatory laws and practices targeting Palestinians. And the U.S. will not engage with itself, given its long-standing commitment to violence to impose the domestic arrangements of its choice, including political change. Since Obama doesn't mean that, the single standard is just more of the familiar deceptive rhetoric. You're watching News from Neptune with reference to the time of year, the false commencement edition. We'll say more about that as the hour goes on. Now we'll go to uh, David Green. And uh, was it all familiar deceptive rhetoric, Damon? Um, absolutely. Um, <laughs> let me just first say that since I have a birthday com coming up this, this, this weekend, I've noted in the past that uh, my birthday coincides with either the take, uh, take off or landing of Charles Lindbergh, I could never recall uh -huh. which, and either the start or end of the war in, the war in Korea uh, from 1950 to 1953. I can never remember which. But in any event, my um, my talk, my uh, my reading is about the Nakba, Al Nakba, the Palestine catastrophe of 1948, past and present. According to international law, ethnic cleansing is defined as quote the attempt to create ethnically homogeneous geographic areas <laughs> through the deportation or forcible displacement of persons belonging to particular ethnic groups. Ethnic cleansing sometimes involves the re removal of all physical vestiges of the targeted group through the, de through the, through the, through the de destruction of monuments, cemeteries, and houses of worship." End quote. In his famous essay, Pr Pr Permission to Narrate, the late Edward Said wrote, quote, this situation privileges, he's talking about the Israel-Palestinian situation, of course, privileges a master narrative highlighting Jewish alienation and redemption with all of it taking place as a modern spectacle before the world's eyes. Palestinians are expected to participate in the dismantling of their own history at the same time. That Said's concerns remain relevant can be found in the New York Times just this past May 14th in the narrative of Ethan Bronner, and of course this can be found in many more places than that. What Bronner wrote about, about Israel Independence Day, what's observed as Israeli Independence Day in 1948, quote, after Israel, Israel declared independence on May 14, 1948, armies from the neighboring Arab states attacked the new nation. During the war that followed, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians fled or were driven from their homes by Israeli forces. Hundreds of Palestinian villages were also, were also de destroyed. The refugees and their descendants remain a central issue of contention in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, 
a man named Yusef Mun Munayer uh, reports, and this is, was recorded or documented in several places, including on the Mondo Weiss website, um, in, in contradiction to Bronner's narrative, and it's a customary sort of propagand propagandistic narrative of the Palestinian expulsion, he wrote, masses of Palestinian refugees were created before one Arab soldier attacked, quote unquote, the new state of Israel. In one story from March 20th, 1947, the, the New York Times actually, the, a full, over a full year, and even before the, uh, the, the, U, U, the U, U, UN uh, passed their par partition edict in, in November of 1947, the New York Times actually addressed the pre-1948 pre situation as one of colonization and describes it rather appropriately. Imagining such characterization in the New York Times t t today is fantasy. And he quotes the Times from th that date as saying, quote, the depopulation of Palestine of its native inhabitants, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Menayer continues here in his own words, the depopulation of Palestine of its native inhabitants took place from 1947 to 1949, was, was commemorated this weekend, and it was marked by Israel with the enforcement of ethnic cleansing. Palestinians, he's referring to the, the Nakba um, um, de demonstrations that occurred this past Sunday in countries in Palestine and in countries around Israel. Palestinians seeking to return were shot down in the process. One reason that the Nakba is marked when the state of Israel was, was, was created is because the, the you know, creation of this state meant that a political force would exist to enforce the exile of the Palestinian re refugees. Sixty-three years later, we are reminded that that, that fear was very well-founded. And then he does go on to quote one, one source from uh, March 20th, 1947, in which the New York Times, in their days in which, before they became Zionists and be supporters of Israel, uh, in which one of their reporters wrote the following, quote, whatever the degree of their superiority complex, however the Jews are certainly, however, the Jews are certainly confident of their ability to bring the Arabs to terms, by persuasion if possible, by might if necessary. The program of the largest terrorist group, the Irgun Zvai Leumi, is, is to evacuate the British forces from Palestine and declare a Zionist state west of the Jordan, and quote, we will take care of the of the Arabs, and end quote. And then Menayer con continues, the the depopulation of Palestine of its native inhabitants, which took place from 1947 to 1949, was was commemorated this weekend. Oh, again, I'm sorry, I'm repeating that, so I won't I won't go back there. Um, let me just let me conclude by saying this. For Israel, denial of the Nakba is a central issue, not only in relation to the politics of occupation, but, the national but their national identity as a Jewish state. Israeli historian Ilan Pape, author of the seminal work The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, defines Israel's land policy as me memoricide, the murder of memory. He describes the Jewish National Fund's administration of 93% of Israel's land. Israel's national parks and resorts are built over the remnants of hundreds of Palestinian villages. Pape writes, quote, the true mission of the JNF, Jewish National Fund, has been to conceal these visible remnants of Palestine, not only by the trees it has planted over them, but also by narratives it has created to deny their existence. These narratives perpetuate a myth, the myth of Palestine as an empty, empty and arid land before the arrival of Zionism. And I would conclude by saying, the national identities of both Palestinians and Israelis since 1948 have been narrated in terms of the struggle to recognize or repress the grievous injustice done to the Palestinian people. Recognition of this injustice by those who have profited from it is necessary, at the very least, to expose a disingenuous peace process, which I feel that we see the con con continuation of, in essence, in, in Obama's speech uh, yesterday that only exacerbates the wounds and bitter legacy of 1948 with words like compromise and co-coexistence. Co 
Justice instead demands truth, compensation, and re reconciliation. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll move on for some other comments and then some questions on what's been said. Uh, Ron Zoke. I want to make uh, perhaps three or four points briefly uh, today and invite you to uh, reflect on them and uh, perhaps comment on them. Uh, I guess my common theme here, perhaps a running theme through much of what I've been saying recently is the empire falters. Um, there was a interesting uh, article by James Carroll originally in the Boston Globe and uh, reposted on Common Dreams this week called A Declaration of Empire, pointing to the uh, apparent uh, proposal, the bill in the House of Representatives, uh, debating a new definition of America's military mission in the world, replacing the mandate adopted immediately after 9-11, instead of merely authorizing the president to make war against those who committed or aided the 2001 attacks. The proposed National Defense Authorization Act expands the notion of America's enemy to include forces associated with named antagonists like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Um, according to its critics, including numerous House Democrats who asked last week that such language be, be dropped, this seemingly innocuous expansion would in effect license an open-ended bleeding of the American battle away from Iraq and Afghanistan to any location in which such vaguely defined associates operate. So uh, this is what has happened. The mandate to uh, fight has become uh, more and more vague, uh, more and more applicable to anyone, uh, anywhere, whose attitude we don't like, apparently. Uh, it's already evident that uh, we've lost focus, and uh, now uh, we designate those that we're killing uh, in the Middle East as suspected Taliban or suspected insurgents or suspected extremists or su suspected jihadists or, or suspected Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. or uh, increasingly uh, those in this bill associated with them, whatever that means, mm -hmm. people who are in the same general area. Uh, apparently. <clears throat> Same ethnic group. Yes. Well, that is an interesting shift in itself. Uh, once upon a time, we declared war against other nations. And uh, that has not happened, as I've often mentioned, apparently since 1941. But uh, more and more, the wars are de facto being waged uh, against uh, uh, organizations. And uh, we have no way of finding out uh, exactly who's a member of a given organization. Uh, what does it take to be a member of the Taliban, for example? Do they carry identification cards in their wallets or what? We don't know. Uh, against races or ethnic groups uh, or uh, religious groups, ideologies, or people who hold particular beliefs and attitudes. The recent line has been that we're justified in uh, uh, killing people who uh, hate us or dislike us mm -hmm. or uh, say th bad things about us. And uh, is that the justification for uh, killing all those people? Well, it appears so. The law after 9-11 made an implicit claim to global force projection based on an emergency. The new legislation would explicitly reject any time or place limitations on that force. <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, we can't accept any uh, definite, clear-cut uh, limitations on what American uh, military force will do. American firepower must be dominant uh, everywhere, apparently, and uh, without regard or reference to any particular uh, group of uh, miscreants who are causing the trouble. Uh, the War Powers Act has become a uh, kind of dead letter. Mm -hmm. It was vetoed by uh, Nixon, but passed over his uh, veto. The 60-day limit on the current hostilities in uh, Libya has been passed, and now some kind of weaseling or trickery is, has been thought up to extend American participation in the uh, war in uh, uh, 
Libya, and uh, we'll see if they can put that across. Another uh, ominous development, uh, Pakistan and NATO forces exchange fire. Uh, they've been shooting at each other, uh, NATO meaning primarily the United States, of course, and uh, uh, Pakistani troops have been shooting each other. The claim that uh, NATO helicopters crossed over into Pakistani airspace and so on. The hostilities are becoming more and more uh, explicit, uh, violent. The latest development I hear today is that the Pakistanis are ordering 50 jet fighters from China, mm -hmm. and uh, Pakistan is being driven by uh, American aggression more and more into the arms of uh, China. The declarations of um, friendship and uh, mutual support from uh, uh, China, between China and Pakistan, are uh, becoming ever more prominent. Next point. Um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel is in Washington uh, today. Before he left, Israel approved 1,500 settler homes in East Jerusalem, yes. uh, according to my sources. Uh, the Interior Ministry Planning Committee gave final approval for two projects. This looks more and more like uh, a defiance of a, a slap in the face to the Americans who are trying to uh, moderate and stop the building of more and more uh, settlements in the West Bank. So just before, hours before uh, Netanyahu was to fly to Washington, this decision was announced. Uh, the clear message to the Americans, according to one source, about Israel's real policy was to refuse to even discuss sharing Jerusalem. According to Ajit Ofran of Peace Now Settlement Watch, in, uh, told the American uh, 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 AFP, the uh, group that uh, monitors such matters. Meanwhile, and the Wall Street Journal points out that uh, Jewish donors have now warned Obama about uh, Israel. Uh, they will not be getting big campaign contributions. Uh, that is, uh, Obama will not be uh, unless he uh, corrects his attitude toward uh, Israel. The complaints began early in President Obama's term, centered on a perception that Mr. Obama has been too tough on Israel. Some Gen Jewish donors say Mr. Obama has pushed Israeli leaders too hard to halt construction of housing settlements in disputed territory, a long-standing element of U.S. policy. So um, uh, there's a division apparently within what we call the Jewish community for uh, <laughs> for um, what uh, you call the Jewish yeah, community. Yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> uh, next point. Uh, America's health care crisis uh, getting worse. The uh, health insurers are making record profits, according to several stories uh, this week, because they think people are postponing care. It's just become too expensive. Mm -hmm. The deductibles are going up. It's becoming more and more common for there to be a $2,000 deductible on uh, health care. It's not clear to me whether that's annual or uh, per e event or, or what. But uh, in any case, the background story is that the uh, U.S. health care uh, insurance industry is making uh, more profits than ever before. There's a column in a uh, Canadian paper, curiously, uh, mentioning that Stephen Helmsley, CEO of United Health Group, um, had a compensation package of almost $102 million last year. Forbes reports, and he has, a, in addition, $111 million uh, in company stock. And life keeps getting better for him and for the health executive uh, executives who are running the big health insurance companies, uh, in part because although they're moaning and screaming about uh, federal regulation and the uh, Affordable Health Care Act and so on, so-called uh, Obamacare, uh, they're making more money than ever, mm -hmm. in part because 
the new health care act will require everyone to have uh, health insurance so it will become uh, compulsory and uh, uh, this will apparently uh, make them even more prosperous. Meanwhile, three out of five adults who lost their jobs in the recent reception also lost their medical coverage, it said. So, in a nutshell, this article reports, uh, less care and higher costs for consumers mean bigger profits for the insurers who are making out like bandits, as we said. Well, I could go on in, in that uh, vein, but I'll stop there and uh, give other people somebody else will go on uh, yeah a, 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 a <laughs> chance that if you're in that vein we're going to get bled anyhow yeah, right? to uh, <laughs> bemoan this uh, situation thank you thank you ron um the uh long time uh middle east reporter robert fisk who writes now primarily for the independent in london uh, had a reflection on Mr. Obama's speech yesterday in which uh, uh, a new commencement uh, was announced of American policy in regard to the Arab Spring and uh, the relationship of Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and uh, his summary uh, is given in the headline in The Independent, lots of rhetoric but very little help. And. Uh, beneath that, the subheading. Uh, then we had to hear what America's role was going to be in the new Middle East. We did not hear if the Arabs wanted them to have a role. So Robert Fisk uh, in The Independent Today writes, it was the same old story. Palestinians can have a viable state, Israel a secure one. Israel cannot be delegitimized. The Palestinians must not attempt to ask the UN for statehood in September. No peace can be imposed on either party. Sometimes yesterday you could have turned this into Obama's forthcoming speech to pro-Israeli lobbyists this weekend. Oh yes, and the Palestinian state must have no weapons to defend itself. So that's what viable means. It was a kind of second coming, I suppose. Cairo repledged, Fisk is referring to uh, uh, Obama's speech in Cairo early on. Another crack at the Middle East, as boring and as unfair as all the other ones, with lots of rhetoric about the Arab revolutions, which Obama did nothing to help. Some of it was positively delusional. Quote, we have broken the Taliban's momentum, the great speechifier said. What? Does he really, really think that? Of course, there was the usual rhetoric bath for Libya, Syria, Iran, the usual suspects. And there were the words, courage, peace, dignity, democracy. A creature from Mars would think that the man had helped to bring about the revolutions uh, in, the, in the Middle East, rather than sat primly to one side in the hope that the wretched dictators might survive. There was some knuckle wrapping to Bahrain, Bahrain, no revolution there, of course. And there was not a word about Saudi Arabia, though I rather fancy its elderly king will be on the blower to Obama in the next few days. Fisk is English, ain't eh? fun calling Obama on the phone. What's all this about change in the Middle East, he'll say. We got one timid reference to Israeli settlement activity. A crack at Hamas, naturally. Lots of tears for the Tunisian vegetable vendor, Mohamed Bouazizi, who started off the revolutions. Tunisia being one state that Obama never actually mentioned until Ben Ali had run away. The humiliation of occupation for the Palestinians, this was a straight repeat of Cairo two years ago, and the tale of a Palestinian, quote, who lost three daughters to Israeli shells in Gaza. I got the point, of course. The man just lost his daughters to shells that happened to fall on them. No suggestion that anyone actually fired them. Is Obama just talking too much? I fear so. He was cashing in, bathing in his own words as he did in his miserable performance when he got the Nobel Peace Prize for speech making. And then I guess, I guessed it before he said it, he compared the Arab revolutions to the American Revolution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That many Arabs fought and died to be free of us than to be like Americans was quite lost on him. And then we had to hear about what America's role was going to be in the new Middle East. 
We did not hear if the Arabs wanted them to have a role, but that's Obama for you, always searching for a role. Well, this weekend is Netanyahu's weekend, and the Israeli settlements, more were flagged during hours, hours before Obama spoke, as Ron just pointed out, will go on as before. And by the time Obama ends up swearing eternal loyalty to the Israelis, the Arabs will forget yesterday's posturings. And the reference to the Jewish state was obviously intended to make Netanyahu, Netanyahu happy. Last time I went there, writes Robert Fisk, there were hundreds of thousands of Arabs who lived in Israel, all of them with Israeli passports. They didn't get a reference from Obama, or maybe I was just imagining. That's Robert Fisk listening to uh, Barack Obama's talk about the Middle East and the Arab Spring uh, yesterday. Uh, as Ron noted, uh, the president is discussing matters with the Prime Minister of Israel today and will speak to the main Israeli lobby group in the U.S., APAC, on the weekend. Uh, but uh, I think we'd probably be um, uh, disappointed if we thought there were going to be any major changes out of this. We'll go on now for some uh, questions and comments uh, around the table. And then if there's time at the end, I want to come back to uh, celebrate uh, commencement uh, at uh, universities across the country. Uh, we missed last week's program, which probably for the local university at least would have been more the, the more uh, uh, appropriate commencement celebration. But uh, we'll see if we get to it. David, questions or comments from you? You mean William P. Daly didn't drop in on, on, the, on the show last week when I, when I wasn't here? And, <laughs> no, uh, we didn't have him. <laughs> oh, no. that's right. Oh. Uh, Ron, Ron Emanuel was coming by, but he was busy. So okay, was, uh, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I guess I would put two questions or comments out there. Um, one has to do with the, the post-Bin Laden uh, movement on the left or on the anti-war and the anti-war movement to capitalize on the death of bin Laden to pr promote withdrawal from Af Af Afghanistan and, oh, yeah. and whether this is to be seen as a serious, even though it's a sincere tactic by the anti-war left, whether it should be seen as a serious tactic. The other question or comment has to do with an editorial and op-ed piece that was published this week in the New York Times by an, by an Israeli politician uh, from the Likud party, which basically made a, a bold, if scurrilous, pr pr proposal for Israel to in annex the entire West Bank, but in doing so to leave the Palestinians stateless. And I'm wondering about the motives of the New York Times for publishing this, not necessarily because they support their view, no, no matter how much they support Israel, but to kind of um, draw the boundaries in a way as to contrast this clearly extreme point of view to the the views expressed in in in, in Obama's speech yesterday, which which clearly are being presented as a a, a moderate move forward and an, as an even-handed approach to the Israel-Palestine uh, uh, conflict. So I would I would. Um, I would put those two um, diverse comments out there. Yeah, so these are both worth, uh, interesting and worthwhile. You want to crack, Ron? Um, no, how seriously do you take this uh, threat of withdrawing campaign contributions from uh, Obama or from anyone else who doesn't uh, take the, uh, the uh, approved line on uh, mm -hmm. Israel? Uh, is that a big factor? Yeah, well... Um, again, I mean, I would, in the context of, of sort of the, the background of all this and the posturing that goes on, I mean, it's, it's clear that what Obama's, what Obama's doing isn't, hasn't proved yet to be any serious threat to Israel's interests. Right. And so... And by um, Israel, you mean the government of Israel. The government too, of Israel, yeah. yeah. Mm. But um, in, in, any, in any event, I guess I would just... Um, you know, again, I would ask, you know, does the, is there, is there any hope for a serious movement for withdrawal from Afghanistan mm -hmm. on the basis of, on the basis of the death of bin Laden, which didn't, which isn't why we're there anyway. Yeah. Right. So I, why does, why does the left, why does the left 
stress that point. Symbolism. I well, uh, yeah. I think there, there there are two possibilities there. One is that what we laughingly call the left of this country buys the propaganda for Afghanistan. Hey, we're there to stop terrorism, right? Uh, well, hey, we just stopped terrorism. We got the big terrorist himself. Therefore, we should come home now, right? Yeah. Now that that that's it's it's an interesting argument because uh, it either buys the nonsense that the administration, last one and this one, have been saying about Afghanistan, or it points up the fact that it is nonsense. I mean, when you listen to that suggestion, you suddenly realize the U.S. is not going to withdraw from Afghanistan, and therefore the explanation that we're there to stop terrorism was always false. It was always a cover story. Uh, it had nothing to do with why the U.S. was really in Afghanistan, which has much more to do with the long-term uh, concern that the uh, U.S. control the greatest energy-producing region in the world. Um, uh, but it, the, the death of, a, of a Osama bin Laden in a peculiar way calls the bluff of the administration. Now, and I think some canny opponents of the war may have been saying that, said, well, you know, take their propaganda at face value. If Osama bin Laden is dead, then we should go home, right? knowing that that's not the reason that the U.S. is there, but still at all, it does ring the changes on the propaganda. There are others who believe it. <laughs> yes. Well, after we've killed the supervillain who's supposedly the, uh, the ultimate cause uh, of it all, I mean, what do we do now? What do we say? Exactly. And um, uh, the need to demonize some one person who's the supposed leader of the uh, um, evil influences in the world um, then does raise this question of what was the point of it all. And uh, some of us exactly. have been raising that question all along. Many people have, in fact, saying there were many chance, many points, many uh, notable points in this Middle Eastern struggle when we could have uh, declared victory and left. but. Uh, uh, there have been all of these announcements from Mission Accomplished up through the killing of Osama bin Laden uh, have given us these opportunities and uh, they haven't been taken, indicating that the real motivation for the struggle is somewhere else. I uh, should mention there's a long piece on the Zenet website by Noam Chomsky in which he expands the piece that we read, read here briefly about the murder of Osama bin Laden uh, and that it's, it's, it's very important and should be looked at. Um, also, we could, without too much problem, in a sort of a little exercise, a setting up exercise after lunch or something, um, sit down and write the State Department's response to the uh, uh, suggestion that you raise, uh, David, uh, since Osama bin Laden is dead, then shouldn't we come home from Afghanistan? No, no, we can, we can write yeah, that yeah. press release right now. Yeah. Uh, the United States is in Afghanistan to support the people of Afghanistan in their attempt to establish a, a viable society over against a, a, a vicious enemy that continues to wage war against the legally constituted government in Kabul. Uh, we will be there to help those people as long as we can, the sacrifices of American soldiers in order to help blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's no problem. You write that with one hand tied behind your back, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, and unfortunately, that's what we'll hear on the uh, uh, PBS NewsHour. Uh, and uh, if we haven't already heard it, uh, we probably have. We just forget because it sounds most, so much the same. I wonder if people understand how dangerous it is in the longer term to c c continue to drive Pakistan into the arms of China. And... Uh, uh, that uh, seems to me uh, one of the most ominous things happening f uh, in view of uh, uh, American interests. Uh, but um, I think this is a very good point. Yeah. The statement uh, by Chomsky that I just mentioned ends with a, um, a comment uh, that uh, comes from Anatole Levin, uh, uh, who's been writing about this uh, material for a while. Ch this, is, this is Chomsky now. Uh, saying, Pakistan is the most dangerous country on Earth, also the world's fastest growing nuclear power with yeah. a huge arsenal. It is held together by one stable institution, the military. Uh, one of the leading specialists on Pakistan and its military, Anatole Levin, writes that, quote, if the U.S. ever put Pakistani soldiers in a position where they felt that honor and patriotism required them to fight America, many would be very glad to do so. 
close quote. And if Pakistan collapsed, a uh, quote, absolutely inevitable result would be the flow of large numbers of highly trained ex-soldiers, including explosive experts and engineers, to extremist groups, close quote. That's the primary threat he sees of leakage of fissile material to jihadi hands, a horrendous eventuality. So I think your, yeah, your point yeah, is well, absolutely right. And the shooting hostilities have already begun. It's been confined to a uh, temporary uh, incident and a uh, relatively small area, but uh, it could expand, and uh, that would be catastrophic, I think. Um, David, second question, uh, what about the uh, New York Times op-ed uh, from a Likud uh, uh, member of, of the Knesset this last week? Um, I, it seems to me there's a, a, a certain similarity in what the um, Obama administration is doing in its selling out. Um, the people it's selling out to, uh, realizing that the administration is selling out, are demanding more. Uh, look at this the way it's worked in regard to Wall Street. Uh, the Obama administration came in uh, with the notion that the uh, Bush administration had been uh, 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 bailing out banks and so forth and we were going to get change. Uh, no <coughs> easy pun there. Uh, we were going to get change from, uh, uh, from Obama. Uh, in fact, Obama leaps into bed with Wall Street. In fact, he'd already been there under the covers there for a long time because uh, Wall Street gave far more money to Obama than it did to McCain in the last presidential election uh, and did uh, whatever Wall Street wanted, all more. And we get these impassioned cries in the Wall Street Journal from elsewhere that Obama was anti-business. Yeah. Uh, but that was possible only because of the rhetorical moves he'd used, because of the lies he told during the campaign, that led some Americans to think, yes, this man will actually defend uh, the majority of the population against uh, the rapacious business class. Um, so uh, even though Obama was being the best friend Wall Street ever had, Wall Street could go ahead and say, aha, but look look what he said, you know, and, and therefore we want more uh, and, and get it. Now, it seems to me a very similar thing is going on in regard, in regard to Israel, that um, uh, between Obama's election and his inauguration, uh, the vicious attack on Gaza went on, and Obama's reaction was, uh, I'm not president yet. We have one president at a time. It's not my problem, you know. Um, the uh, uh, Israel, which has been um, uh, saying things about how uh, uh, awful the Obama administration has been towards Israel, why they're actually talking about, you know, freezing the settlements and so on, not doing anything about it, but talking about it, uh, is in the same position as Wall Street, saying, look, you said things and so forth, and it's part of what you've done. What you've done is obviously, you know, very much traditional American support for its primary client in the region, but, you know, you've said some things that we got to, you know, uh, we, we can extract something from this. We can get more because you haven't paid perfect lip service to us. I think it's sort of on that level. You agree, but David? I, well, I just, I'm just still trying to, trying to understand. I mean, here's here's an, an op-ed piece that called for the the permanent statelessness of 2.5 billion mm -hmm. Palestinians living on the West Bank as a as a solution, as a kind of a final status for this problem. I can't believe that even the New York Times editorialists meaning I guess Bill Keller and right. whoever else you know runs that really believe that so that they're putting it there you know that there must yep. have been some other reason for well, them putting it there in contrast with whatever else is coming down the pipe before and after I mean they had a an op-ed piece by um, by Abbas uh, on, on the on the on, you know with, with all the all the usual letters in response in opposition to a boss. I mean, there's been all this customary rhetoric, but that that kind of lies to the to the, the right extreme of even all that. But you see, the point is, uh, by, by moving the goalpost, so to speak, by sh yeah. sharing where the right extreme is, right. it makes the middle of the road position. Uh, you know, here, here it was about, well, we're not crazy like you know, yeah, the Likud yeah. guy. We're sitting here in the middle of the road right, doing exactly. what we've always done yeah, in, so, in, in, de in yeah. destroying the, Palestinian as, uh, the Palestinians right. as a people and as a nation. Uh, but at least, gee, we're not like that crazy right. guy. Right, and that's, yes. Yeah. That's, so that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I guess you're, 
I mean, I didn't mean to ask a, a rhetorical question. Well, but I, I think I think you yeah. know. <laughs> I think you're. <laughs> I think I think that's kind of what I'm getting at by asking that question. Well, it's worthwhile formulating that question. It's worthwhile to point it out because uh, people picking up the New York Times saying, "Okay, here's what the Israelis are talking about." Thank God, Obama is standing against them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we continue the round of questions. It's your turn, Ron, if you want, uh, if you have uh, others. Um, did you have any uh, comments on this health insurance thing? To me, it's part of the larger picture of trying to uh, operate these things, human services, on a for-profit basis. Mm -hmm. And what do you think... Uh, is the uh, prognosis there, or uh, can that ever really? No uh, pun intended. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, be, back uh, in the, the prognosis vein. is the patient died. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're back right. in the same vein again. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sucking uh, blood. Yeah. Um, my own belief, after looking at this for a number of years, is that uh, for-profit education, health services, and even communication and information services can never be uh, adequate, that uh, they all make money by decreasing services rather than increasing them. And uh, do you see any uh, problems with that conviction? Well, it, it, what I th think is uh, an interesting uh, sign in the last week or two on this line is the reemergence of the Medicare for All line. We're hearing it in some other places now. Um, and it, it seems to me that if one wants to be really optimistic about this, one could look at the sort of Tea Party opposition to Obamacare, which is, 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 is mad in all sorts of ways, mad in both senses of the word in all sorts of ways, as a matter of fact. Um, but realize that uh, if uh, it were, in fact, to begin to understand some of the things that you were just talking about, like whose interests Obamacare is really being run for, uh, it's not out of the question to think that we could coalesce uh, a, a movement demanding health care, demanding in the words of the famous Tea Party or government keep your hands off my Medicare, uh, you know, that that actually does make sense and that people de demand that the Obama administration, which is invading uh, Medicare and agreeing to the destruction of Medicaid, perhaps, uh, uh, actually reverse that. Yeah. And we could get a serious uh, 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 movement towards a Medicare for all, which is essentially a single payer system uh, that uh, reasonable people on this matter have been saying is the only way out for the United States at the, uh, in, the, in the present situation. It drags it kicking and screaming into the modern world, uh, things that all other uh, advanced capitalist states are doing. Uh, there's an interesting parallel here to the emergence in the last week of a... Um, uh, a movement in the Senate amongst right-wing senators calling for an end to the Afghanistan campaign. Now, this is not coming from liberal Democrats. It's coming from right-wingers, including the egregious Rand Paul, uh, who are saying, look, uh, the president doesn't have any authority to conduct these wars. Uh, the, the Constitution sets out a system, you were talking about that earlier, and he hasn't followed it. That's obviously true. They're right about that. And they say he's spending immense amounts of money that should be spent on other things. That, too, is true. Now, the fact that's coming from an unusual point in the political spectrum, uh, in a way, it seems to me to be hopeful. Uh, the possibility of coalescing once again in opposition to the war on those grounds, uh, drawing from a variety of political positions, uh, you know, uh, that makes me happy. Yeah. Well, uh, we see the re, uh, reaction to that in this uh, proposed legislation that I mentioned yes. of broadening the terms of uh, American military authorization removing all uh, barriers of time and space and uh, talking about um, our uh, uh, possible attack upon uh, anyone associated with uh, certain antagonists, uh, which can be uh, not just national states anymore, but uh, um, 
groups defined essentially by their belief or ideology. But the point is, that is the de facto situation right yes, now, as Libya yes. shows. That's exactly what the, the, this, uh, this president is doing. Uh, and he's doing it uh, even more egregiously than the last president did, and with less benefit of theory. I mean, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the executive theory of the Bush administration, cockamamie as it was, was still an attempt at a theory for power somehow inherent in the executive, as your friend Harvey C. Mansfield, you know, was pointing out. Uh, this administration is doing, doing that and more without benefit of theory. They just do it. And uh, the notion that a, a uh, legislative recognition of the situation is coming up may in fact be an occasion, oh God, I'm overcome with optimism today, it must be the meds, uh, <laughs> is, is a notion that we really should be debating this. We should be talking about the fact whether the president can make war on anyone he wants, whenever he wants, whether the president can indicate any individual, American citizen or not, for some summary execution on suspicion of terrorism. Uh, that's what this administration is doing. Yeah. The fact that the uh, uh, the Congress wants to talk about making it legal may be an occasion for pointing out how outrageously illegal and unconstitutional it really is. Well, I hope you're right. There's every indication that the abdication of Congress on this point is so extreme and, and so definitive that, uh, that that will go nowhere. But we'll do, see. do you do you see the opposition the the uh, the beliefs of, of Rand Paul and whatever Republican, whatever other Republican senators are opposing, are calling for withdrawal from Afghanistan. Do you see them as being less principled than those of the usual Republican House members like Ron Paul and our own Congressperson and others, who I I tend to see as relatively principled? Mm -hmm. Are you saying this senatorial move? Are you implying it's less principled or? equally principled or cynic, yeah. cynical in some way? It's difficult to say. I mean, a lot of I mean, talk... I mean, yeah. far, far from them from being cynical, but still. Yeah. Yeah. I place a certain amount of principled, of principled belief in what, in what Ron Paul and even Johnson, Tim Johnson yes. is saying. That's, I, I agree with you on that. Um, uh, the, the question of the intentions of political actors seems to me sometimes at least misleading. Uh, saying, okay, I, I mean, you know, I, I think there's, there's a great danger in misinterpreting the famous Eliot line, the last temptation is the greatest treason, to do the right deed for the wrong reason. And we keep wondering, well, why are they doing this? Is Rand Paul doing that just because he wants to get at a, uh, a, a democratic president, you know, and therefore that's the wrong thing? To, no, let, let's talk about what's being done and leave the motives and the intentions uh, to the a decent obscurity of, uh, 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 of, of some fever dreams, perhaps. Um, I'd mentioned this piece by Noam Chomsky on Zenet today uh, about uh, uh, the killing of Osama bin Laden, and he says in the midst of it, it's clear that alleged intentions are irrelevant. Japanese fascists apparently did believe that by ravaging China, they were laboring to turn it into an earthly paradise. We don't know whether Hitler believed that he was defending Germany from the wild terror of the Poles, as he said, or was taking over Czechoslovakia to protect its population from ethnic conflict and provide them with the benefits of a superior culture, or was saving the glories of the civilization of the Greeks from barbarians of East and West, as his acolytes claimed. He's quoting Martin Heidegger there, by the way. And it's even conceivable that Bush and company believe they were protecting the world from destruction by Saddam's nuclear weapons. It's believed it's possible. All irrelevant, though ardent loyalists on all sides may try to convince themselves otherwise. It seems to me the irrelevancy is the thing that I want to underline there. That, that the question of stopping the war and the question of calling upon the American president to observe the Constitution are worthwhile things to do, even if they are being done by base motives by the younger Mr. Paul. I agree, but I'm still more comfortable with, if we're going to talk about a left and right anti-war movement, yes. I'm, more, I'm still more comfortable the pro I'm more comfortable with the prospects, or more optimistic about the prospects of that, of that movement, if there is some principled basis, that, as well as pragmatic basis for that to happen. 
And I don't disagree with you there, David. I mean, it was, you know, early on in the Vietnam conflict, let's point out there were two different reasons, two very different reasons to oppose yeah. the war. Yeah. One was that the U.S. was committing a vast crime. The other was the U.S. was spending too much money. Yeah. And uh, now, in, in terms of the actual operation against that war, an attempt to bring that war again, uh, to an end, uh, I, who held the first view, was happy to demonstrate with people who held the second. Uh, and it seems to me that, you know, we're in a similar situation. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll but, agree for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Until problem, next week. <laughs> yeah, the problem is that this is really uh, a uh, metaphysical kind of uh, view and uh, actual empirical evidence of what people's motives and intentions are, are very difficult, uh, it's very difficult to discern uh, somehow. And yet uh, some writers point out that we're forced into doing that inevitably in the law there's the doctrine of mens re, the, uh, the guilty uh, intention and so on, which has to be an essential element in uh, many crimes and so on. And uh, maybe that's so, but uh, every such statement I think about anyone's uh, ultimate intention or uh, motivation should be viewed as a hypothesis, and then we can try to gather evidence uh, that comports with it and uh, the evidence that uh, contradicts it, and then make a judgment uh, on that uh, basis, which ultimately we may be required to do. The problem is this gets perverted into the popular mind into the question of whether these people are sincere or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some people try to make their judgments of politicians on the basis solely uh, not the truth or adequacy of what they're saying, but whether they think the person is sincere, which I, I think is uh, childish and uh, um, really uh, uh, quite inane. But The real issue is not whether Hitler was sincere, the issue was whether he was committing crimes. Yes, and, yes. Uh, that's, you know. Yeah. Um, and the, there, are, again and again, this comes up when a criminal is con uh, accused uh, he will say, well, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. Well, and, yeah. and, and uh, to move into the criminal court raises some interesting question in yeah. terms of what should be done with the person. That's yeah. where you, 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 the doctrine of mens rea, as you, as you, as you said. Uh, for politics, the matter in some sense doesn't apply. I have in my kitchen, have, have had since uh, the, my children were small, uh, a card that's uh, uh, list sort of first aid procedures. It's entitled, What to Do Until the Physician Comes. Now, what we perhaps need here, Ron, is a card that says, What to Do Until the Metaphysician Comes. <laughs> right, right. Uh, that will tell us yeah. how we can oppose these vast crimes yeah. that, we're that are being done in our name, that right, we're responsible right. for, that yeah. the United States is committing uh, when, and when it's still a putative democracy. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, I think we can't, um, yeah, we can't wait for the metaphysician when it's time to, for some first aid. Yeah, yeah. We're constantly put in the position of having to judge people's motives and intentions anyway and uh, just recognize that what we're doing and how uh, uh, dubious uh, it can be and uh, how easily it can go wrong because of our uh, own uh, personal biases. But I wanted to conclude today with... Um, W.H. Uh, Auden's uh, poem uh, from 1946, entitled A Reactionary Tract for the Times. Um, at the very end of the uh, Second World War, at the uh, um, uh, commence, first commencement held by Harvard University after the end of the war, uh, Auden was invited to deliver a poem by the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Uh, it's a regular exercise in the Harvard commencement. Uh, and he wrote a poem, uh, in fact, I think, uh, point, an excellent poem, uh, called Under Which Liar. Now, he did spell it L-Y-R-E, but Auden loved puns as much as Shakespeare did, and Under Which Liar was the title of his, uh, uh, of his poem, in which he contrasted two ways of looking at uh, education and politics. One represented by Hermes or Mercury, the, the trickster, the, uh, the thief of the Olympic go Olympian gods. And the other by Apollo, uh, supposedly the god of culture, uh, certainly the upright uh, figure of, um, 
uh, of excellence. Um, and uh, it is a wonderful poem. Uh, I, uh, it takes a few minutes uh, to uh, present, and I think I'm going to save it until next week. But I'm going, I am saying that uh, I'm recommending to you uh, W.H. Auden's reactionary uh, tract for the times uh, on the occasion of our false commencement uh, uh, program. Uh, the uh, commencement, the beginning of something, uh, is frequently misrepresented. I certainly think it's being misrepresented in the United States right now uh, by the administration and its Middle Eastern policy. This is a false commencement indeed, and so it may be a good time to, uh, to bring it all home. Strange things are happening in American universities. It seems to me that uh, uh, the last several years have seen perhaps greater changes in American universities than any part of the time that I've been involved with them, and that goes back a long ways. I was an undergraduate during the fabled 1960s. Eh? Uh, now, uh, what's happened is shown up by the fact that uh, uh, we have an absolutely quiescent university culture on all the questions we've been talking about today. Uh, where are the faculty, where are the students who a generation ago uh, would have been uh, exercised about these issues? They're all being very quiet. They know how hard it is to get a job. Uh, well, that's understandable, but uh, this is a change. Things are very different. You've been watching News from Neptune on our banner public television for the third week of May 2011. Our program is named in honor of Noam Chomsky. This has been the False Commencement Edition. If our program interested you, you might want to look at these programs heard regularly throughout each week on UPTV. White House Chronicle, uh, 7 a.m. on Sundays, repeated Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Democracy Now! every day uh, on uh, UPTV at 7 a.m. And m I must say this morning's program, which is available online, includes the only good uh, account of Obama's speech that I've seen any place yesterday. Um, number three, The Big Picture with Tom Hartman, weekdays at 8 a.m. Uh, four, Labor's Worldview with our friends Dave Johnson and Jim Iman, the Sundays at 4 p.m. The David Pakman Show, Saturdays at 7 a.m., repeated through the week. Essential Descent, Thursday at 1.30, which this week, uh, this Thursday, um, features Michael Parenti with the second part of a talk on lies, war, and empire. Uh, and a second version of Essential Descent, Sundays at 2. This Sunday, Elliot Adams, uh, a former president of Veterans for Peace, uh, in a talk uh, from about a year ago about Gaza. Uh, once again, of course, quite important. Uh, I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Zoke and David Green. This and other editions of this program will be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I can be reached at carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I'm happy to receive your comments. My thanks to our director Jason Liggett and to Nate Owens for making the program available to you. Inshallah we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies. And a good night to you.